Hey guys, it's Metacosis Perfect Sinatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. What is cracking, racking? Let's continue our genetics discussion in this biology playlist. In previous videos, we talked about an introduction to genetics and important definitions. We talked about Mendelian laws, the first law of segregation and the second law of independent assortment. We talked about how scientists came to know that DNA is the actual genetic material. We talked about mutations. We talked about Punnett squares, monohybrid crosses, dihybrid crosses, sex link crosses. Today, it's time to dig deeper into the Hardy-Weinberg equation or the Hardy-Weinberg principle. Trying to measure the frequency of an allele and the frequency of the genotype or phenotype. Please watch my biology videos in order. Back to math. If p plus q equals 1, don't you think that we can square both sides and nothing will change? Yo, oh, they would remain equal. Let's square the second part because it's easy. 1 times 1 is 1. Okay, let's square the first part. You get the p squared, you get the q squared, do not forget, in the middle, 2pq. This is the Hardy-Weinberg principle. Nothing more, nothing less. The trick is to understand what P stands for, what Q means. How about P squared? What does that mean? 2PQ, what does that mean? Q squared, i.e. You need to evolve from theoretical mathematics to applied math. So let's see. Capital T, capital T. That's a tall individual. Small t, small t short individual. Therefore, the big T is the dominant allele. The small t is the recessive allele. As you know, allele is the copy of the gene because you have two copies for each gene. One from mommy, one from daddy. Who's your daddy? Now, suppose that I told you that the frequency of the dominant allele, capital T, in a population is about 60%. What do you think the frequency of the recessive allele is? Well, 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 it has to be 100 minus 60 equals 40%. Look at you, my friend. Awesome. Genius. And how did you do that? Well, I knew that's either dominant or recessive. I don't have any other choices. Which means that the frequency of the dominant plus the frequency of the recessive have to equal 1. Exactly. Now, since we agreed that this is true, can we square both sides of the equation? Yes, we can. Now pay close attention because this is the most difficult part. What is P alone? Well, P alone is the frequency of the dominant allele in a population. This is a copy of your gene on your chromosome. It does not tell me whether you are T capital T capital or T capital T small. Let alone did it tell me about your phenotype, how you look like as an individual in real life. This is just the frequency of the dominant allele, which is a copy of your gene. So the P is the frequency of the uppercase T. All right. How about the Q? Well, it's the frequency of the lowercase T. What does that mean? The frequency of the recessive allele in the same population. How about P squared? This is the frequency of T, T, individuals in that population. The homozygous dominant genotype which will appear as a tall phenotype. Genotype is your genes. Phenotype is how you appear, like a phoenix, phenotype. How about the Q squared? It's the frequency of small t, small t. Everything is lowercase, i.e. it's the frequency of homozygous recessive genotype, which is the same as short phenotypes in the same population. How about the 2PQ? This is the frequency of uppercase T, lowercase T in the same population. If this sounds gibberish to you, let's try this example. Suppose that the frequency of the dominant allele in a population is 70%. Can you deduce everything else? The answer is absolutely yes. Now try to answer it on your own and I'll show you the answer in the next slide. But now, please pause. Now let's think about that. If the frequency of the dominant allele, which is uppercase T in a population is 70% or 0.7. Okay, so my P is 0.7. Nice. What do you think my Q is? Well, Q equals 1 minus P, which equals 1 minus 0.7 equals 0.3 
which is about 30%. You can write as 30% or 0.3. Both are absolutely correct. Next, what's the frequency of the homozygous dominant genotype, i.e. the frequency of the homozygous tall individuals in that population? Oh, they're asking about P squared now. Exactly. Take your P, which is 70% or 0.7, and simply square it. You get 0. 49, which is the same stinking thing as 49%. And this is the frequency of the homozygous dominant genotype in a population. And of course, these people are tall and homozygous. Next, what's the frequency of the heterozygous dominant genotype in the same population? What are they asking about now? 2PQ. 2PQ, all right. 2 times P times q. What is the p? Well, I know that p is 0.7. And what's the q? I know it's 0.3. And this will give you what? 0.42, which is 42%. Awesome. Last question. What's the frequency of the homozygous recessive genotype, lowercase t, lowercase t, individuals in that population? Now they're asking about what? They're asking about q squared. And what is the q? 0.3. So 0.3 squared equals 0.09, which is 9%. But hey, Medicosis, how can I verify that my answers are correct? Easy. Apply them into the Hardy-Weinberg equations. Let's go. P plus Q equals 1. What was your P? 0. 0.7. What was your Q? 0. 0.3. 0. 0.7 plus 0. 0.3 equals 1. You are correct, my friend. Let's try the other one. P squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. What was your p squared? It was 0 0.49. How about your 2pq? 0 0.42. And what about your q squared? That was 0 0.09. Add them all together. Voila, they equal 1 proving to you that you got the correct answers. Oh, Medicosis, I thought that the Hardy-Weinberg equation is super hard. Oh, shut up. You just need one number. If they give you one number, you can deduce everything else. If they give you the P, you can deduce everything else. If they give you the P squared, you can get the square root of this and you'll go back to the P. If they give you the Q alone, you can deduce everything else. If they give you the Q squared, you can get the square root, go back, and then deduce everything else using these two equations. A child can do this. Just to recap, this is my P, this is my Q, this is P squared. Now the heterozygous individuals are the 2PQ, and the small t, small t, that will be the Q squared. Let's put it all together. Let's do this Punnett square. What's the frequency of P? 0.7, aka 70%, and we're talking here about the dominant allele. How about the recessive allele? 0.3, which is 30%. That's your Q, that's your little t. We're talking about alleles here, and we'll put this here on top, as well as on the side. Perfect, and then you multiply. Multiply this by this, 0.7 times 0.7 is 0.49. That's your p squared, which means this is the percentage, the frequency of homozygous tall individuals in the community. How about the homozygous short individuals? That will be 9%, 0.3 times 0.3, which is 0.09, which equals 9%. This is Q squared. This is lowercase t, lowercase t. Now recall that the 2PQ equals 0.42. This is the 2PQ. What do you think just 1PQ equals half of this number? 0.21. Because you have 0.21 here and 0.21 here. When you add these two together, what you get? 2PQ. Ah, it makes sense. That's why if you remember my Punnett square video, we said that the ratio of the offspring will be 1 to 2 to 1. 1 will be homozygous dominant, capital T, capital T. 2 individuals will be heterozygous and tall, capital T, small t. This is the 2. This is the your 2PQ. And the last individual will be small t, small t. Oh, finally, it makes sense. The math is the math is the math. And this is how you destroy your exam with facts and logic.
Now make no mistake about it, the Hardy-Weinberg principle can get really crazy, like this question right here. Suppose that we're talking about an autosomal recessive disease known as cystic fibrosis. The carrier rate in the community is 1 in every 25. What does that mean? It means that in this community, 1 out of every 25 persons is a carrier for cystic fibrosis. Here's the question. If this is the carrier rate, please calculate the prevalence of cystic fibrosis disease. I want the sick individuals in the community. The answer to this question is to be found in my cystic fibrosis video, which you will find here on YouTube in my pulmonology playlist. If you like this video, you will adore my renal physiology course. We talk about GFR, proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, collecting ducts, etc as well as my brand new surgery high yields course. We're talking 23 gigabytes of medical pearls. You do not want to miss the next videos in this biology playlist because we will review and do questions. So please subscribe, hit the bell and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.